Yeah, I think this is going to work fine, because cool. um, the internet seems like it's fine, so, it's, yeah. Let me just make a kind of preemptive request. Um, people are going to keep filtering in, you know, probably throughout the session, and it's really helpful if uh, everyone, like, in these rows can kind of sit towards the center of the row, so that way if people come in they can just kind of fit in the side and not try to climb over you. Um, so, thanks. Much appreciated. Yeah, I wonder what it looks like. I have a few notes attached to it. I don't want it to, I don't want it to go onto the screen. But maybe that just brings it up like that. And then you can see this with your notes. Yeah, okay. That works, I guess. Although you don't have to. Okay. I don't know. Let me grab it. What are we going off of right now? Yeah, we're going off of this. Yeah, that, that's fine. As long as it's linked with the um, yeah. 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 They're not, but I guess I could just go forward with this one as well as the other one. Oh, really? I mean... Oh, wait. No, it's working. Is it working now? Oh. Yeah, I'm not looking at the Actually, I think that is, yeah. Maybe it just, okay. so you just use the arrows? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let me. Okay. Is that all right? Uh, yeah, as long as. Just minimize it and tell me. I think that'll just work fine. Oh, I don't know where that. I'm really bad at like dual monitor It's okay. Uh, I'll I'll put it. Up. Okay. Up You'll put it up. After. I'll make sure it's going forward. Yeah. I'll just create it. Do I have water and everything? Yes. <laughs>
Hello? Hello? Is the mic on? Anyone? Alright. Hey, hello? Oh, great. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Sweet. Thank you all for coming. Ooh, oh, it's getting louder. Um, <laughs> um, thanks everyone coming. Um, this is the, the GIF Economies panel. Um, I hope you all had a good day one. <laughs> um, I, I actually sadly missed, missed the first day I was on a plane. So, um, My name is Shah. Uh, I'm just going to be introducing the, the panelists today. Um, I'm pretty excited about what everyone's going to be talking about, uh, and uh, I'm excited to hear the questions everyone has afterwards. So first up we have Lyle. Um, Lyle is a media scholar living in Brooklyn. Uh, she makes a podcast around, about Aaron Carter um, that can be found at aarencarterparty-comegetit.tumblr.com. That's pretty easy to remember and theorizes extemporaneously at pussy-strut.tumblr.com. Uh, she's on Twitter at Pussy Trust. Uh, so please give it up for, for Lyle. Thanks. My project is about um, makeup tutorials on YouTube. Uh, I want to ask if you've noticed how it looks like everybody has cheekbones nowadays. Uh, that's because of contouring, <laughs> a practice that has become sort of more widespread and accessible um, and no longer merely the proven provenance of Kardashians due to, I would like to <laughs> submit um, makeup tutorials on YouTube. It's sort of a place where you can learn how to make yourself look away. Um, so one of the analytics what I'm trying to use is the idea of a technique of self, which is an idea that Michel Foucault talks about in his later work, which just means like something that people do to themselves uh, to achieve a particular ideal um, about their body or their self. Um, and so I think that makeup uh, falls pretty cleanly under this practice. So I look at some two amateur beauty YouTubers um, rather than professional beauty YouTubers, because those people certainly do exist. Um, Michelle Phan is super famous and rich from her. She's like managed to spin her um, makeup channel into like a full-time job, but my interest is rather in amateurs um, who are less sort of professionalized and more interesting to me. Um, so to talk about beauty is to enter into an age-old feminist debate about sort of the politics of beauty and sort of the ways in which beauty controls women or um, sort of subjects them to particular scrutiny or uh, sort of makes women or feminized people learn um, to capitulate to certain kinds of violence on their body um, and certain kinds of gazes at all times. So I'm trying to ask what beauty does, not whether beauty is good or bad. Um, Naomi Wolf has articulated one of the most famous critiques of beauty uh, in her 1993 book, The Beauty Myth, which says basically that when women are trying to be beautiful and competing with each other for beauty, they're not competing for resources like jobs or money. Um, and she sees the rise of sort of a homogenized or idealized beauty standard connected to uh, mass media technologies such as photography. Um, and so Naomi Wolf thinks that print media is not a good place for women to sort of um, 
find solidarity, although it could be because of advertisers' interests uh, kind of controlling the content, and here's like a Dove ad to kind of uh, demonstrate the ways in which like feeling good about your body is sold to you, or kind of foisted upon you to help you buy soap. Um, I also look to Dr. Susan Bordeaux's work on beauty as a disciplinary system, um, but also a place where subjects uh, are able to sort of find pleasure. Um, to, to sort of despite being subject to beauty ideals or um, made to kind of be beautiful through makeup or whatever, dieting. Um, so I'm just trying to hold both of those in contention. So I'm interested in makeup rather than uh, cosmetic surgery and eating disorders, which a lot of people were writing about in the 90s, um, because it's relatively like not dangerous to put on makeup as opposed to doing an extreme dieting regime or um, getting a, you know, a surgery to make your body look a certain way. It's less extreme and it also kind of happens every day. Um, so I'm trying to look at makeup as something other than like a denigrated everyday feminized practice and trying to think about how makeup is a practice through which people really constitute themselves um, by repeating this action over and over and that's kind of what I mean uh, as a, perform a Butlerian performance of self. It has to be done over and over. Um, and it sort of a, it helps you be a certain kind of person. Um, so I also want to think about how sort of difficult it is to apply makeup and how much knowledge it actually takes, embodied and archival, um, to produce a particular look with makeup. And you can just think about you know the first time you ever tried to apply lipstick, to um, to really remember how it's not especially intuitive and it's it takes a lot of knowledge. Um, and so. For Wolf, so I want to step away from the media world that Wolf and Bordeaux are both critiquing in the early 90s and think about the fact that uh, in our, our everyday media experiences now, we sort of are able to see images that people produce of themselves rather than uh, mass mediated images that are controlled sort of by beauty editors and makeup artists and advertisers. So there's sort of this uh, <laughs> DIY normativity that the selfie helps usher in. So uh, the first case that I look at is. Uh, a YouTuber named Kaylin Marie, who's actually sort of an anti-celebrity on YouTube because she's like not considered to be a discerning reviewer of products. She kind of likes everything that she reviews. Um, and I, let's see, she also sort of catches flack for not being like rich and not being uh, thin. Her weight kind of fluctuates and stuff. I would say that she's a technically proficient um, makeup artist, but uh, she like, well, she found herself in a situation basically where people sent her fake products to review. So the way that these review videos work is that you can be sent products by companies who, you know, as a way to sort of get their, get advertising basically. You'll review the products that you get for free. So here's an example. Oh, you can't hear it. I'm sorry. Basically she's talking about um, and soapy a soap and that she loves, very enjoyable but it's like a cheap very soap. Moisturizing. And it's, it's a result of it's this, so, uh, this so prank. It's so smooth on my skin. And it just felt amazing, like, this soap. Um, that, it's kind of bugging my PowerPoint, but, um, so she kind of likes everything, but then she realizes it's a prank because she gets a body spray that's maybe made of, like, salt and vinegar or something, and she, she makes a second video where she's, she says, she realizes, like, what am I putting on my body? Like, I just, you know, she receives these products in the mail from a fake company from these, like, dedicated anti-fans who are, um, kind of... Uh, and she realizes that it's actually, you know, her actual body that is sort of on the line here, um, and that, and she doesn't, she doesn't know why. So the second case that I look at is uh, a woman called Juicy Tuesday. Her name is Teresa, um, and she kind of became famous through posting like a mixed review of some clothing that she received to review, and the clothing company reacted to her mixed review by contacting her and saying we had to fire people as a result of your mixed review and can you please take it down and so she made this video um, where she kind of she goes to expose the clothing company which is called Hot Miami Styles um, and so Teresa is not a uh, anti-celebrity she people kind of like her um, but I, I think that the, there's gonna be a clip and you'll see sort of what um, how, how important the, a particular ethic in her reviewing practice is um, here in a second Oh wait, okay. Um, so these review practices are really something that I'm interested in as sort of places where uh, feminized solidarity might be cultivated um, through, these, through uh, these tutorial videos. And the clip is coming presently. 
in some ways it's even benefits Hot Miami Styles because when all subscribers are seeing is amazing positive reviews on your products, they begin to feel as though so like they're being lied to. to the all online shopping has issues. And if you take the time to scroll the comment section of my video, you will see that the mass majority of people feel that they've been repeatedly lied to by other YouTubers about the quality of the product. So you don't want to lie to your subscribers. She, she you know, she feels really strongly about this uh, kind of particular reviewing ethic. So, you know, what is what is the beauty YouTube subject's self-relation like? Well, uh, the knowledge that she shares with her audience has to emerge directly from her particular embodied experience, um, and she has to perform this knowledge on her body, uh, which I think is uh, something that's interesting in the face of sort of arguments about the internet that say, oh, it's post-body, or oh, there's no body um, in these in the internet. I think it's very present, and especially in these practices that are actually about making bodies and selves. Um, so I was focused on review videos, um, which are about, you know, women or feminized people sort of trying to share a particular, like, kind of knowledge so that you don't, like, waste money on bad products. Um, so I think that that is super interesting. Um, and so to be a good reviewer on YouTube, you need to demonstrate uh, a discerning knowledge of both your body and your audience's body. Um, so I, I call it a body of knowledge. Um, and it's supposed to provide sort of a counter discourse to um, the mass, mass media about beauty, which is like controlled in uh, insignificant ways by advertising, advertising money. Um, so let's see. Uh, Beauty YouTube rearranges the chain of mediation that has traditionally, um, well, that that has usually kind of controlled discourse around beauty, um, which is to say that the YouTuber has to think about her, I'm sorry, I got a little mixed up here, but um, so basically she controls, you know, everything. She's not, there's no art director, or editor, or uh, model. She's doing everything. And they all, it, all of these, uh, the things that kind of go into a review or into beauty um, tutorials have to be produced by herself, by her body. And she has to sort of foreground her audience's body in these reviews in order for them to be ethical or like kind of um, strident. So um, let's see. I'm interested in reading beauty YouTube as something that's both a space of feminine camaraderie uh, kind of through the discipline of beauty. So it's not, you know, merely capitulating to the, the demands of beauty on a feminized subject, but it's also sort of a place where there can be playful mastery. Um, and, you know, this is really something that uh, Foucault kind of emphasizes in his theories of the subject is that, you know, it can be like fun to be disciplined in these moments. So it's sort of a, uh, it's interesting to me, even as these uh, media spaces are sort of rearranged. Um, so yeah, I see them as caught between the productive balance of power and the disciplinary demands of beauty. Um, so it's, you know, it's never just that power is sort of acting from the top down through beauty or that, you know, women are resisting through their feminine solidarity review videos. It's kind of both that both of these um, forces are at play and, uh, these women are, or these beauty YouTubers are sort of negotiating these things on their own bodies and through their audience's bodies in really uh, sort of repetitive and um, complex complex ways. So at the risk of uh, capitulating to like a sort of techno-utopianism or something, or merely reinscribing discursive violence against, you know, everyday feminine practices like beauty, I really want to emphasize the interplay of uh, the discipline of beauty and the pleasure that you can find in um, mastering a practice like cosmetics. Oh, and so this is supposed to play, but I don't know what's playing. This is, Tina Woods is a Vine celebrity and she made this video uh, where she's just like, why do I wear makeup? Because it's like not for, it's not because I'm anticipating like a man liking it. And she's, you know, she's like a 16 year old. So she's just like, not like I'm anticipating someone at high school liking my eyeliner, but because, um, because I'm, I'm beautiful and because I like want to demonstrate this mastery that I have over this particular skill. Um, yeah. <sighs> Felt like that was a lot. Thanks.
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Uh, that was so good. Um, next up, we have Anastasia. Uh, Anastasia. Um, Anastasia is a Portland-based writer, uh, beginning a master's program in art history in the fall. Uh, she's interested in offering queer fem feminist critique of visual culture. Uh, and her recent research traces the genealogies of thought around gendered subjectivities within the history of feminist art and performance. Her writing on art has been, has previously appeared on Daily Serving and uh, Temporary Art Review. So let's give it up for Anastasia. So uh, I forgot to mention, please tweet the panels under the hashtag B4. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anastasia Twazin, and I'm going to be, I'm going to move this a little closer, actually. Um, I'm looking at the topic of self-imaging and feminist art, um, beginning with a historical perspective on narcissism and the critical reception of the work of Hannah Wilk in the 70s, um, who extensively worked with her own image. And I'm connecting some of those ideas from the 70s to our contemporary situation with um, regarding selfie culture and the overall practice of um, self images circulating online, online exhibitions. Um, and I do this in part to raise the question of how the discourse around body art has um, changed since 40 years ago, but also to ask why we remain stuck on some of the same problems of visibility that existed back then. Um, and I wanted to point out that there's a really good connection um, to my presentation, which is another presenter in this conference named Aria Dean. She wrote a, an essay for the new inquiry called Closing the Loop, and it was published a few months ago, I think. Um, it's really great. Uh, talks a lot, a lot about the same issues that I am addressing. And I actually emailed her and kind of was chatting about that. And she's, I think she's going next in a different panel. So that would be another really good one to see. Um, okay, let's see. So, um, Freud presented narcissism in his uh, 1914 essay on narcissism, wh where he associated primary narcissism, which kind of represents a lib libidinal, he called it a libidinal complement to the egoism of the instinct of self-preservation which essentially means he considered it separate from a, the kind of deviant or pathological form of narcissism. Um, and he associated that primary narcissism with both homosexuality and female identity. I put, uh, put a passage from on narcissism up here, kind of funny. You can see that he has a sentence where he kind of associates narcissism with like cats, large beasts of prey, criminals, humorous, and all of that is connected to like the primary narcissism that he's also associating with like a feminine form of narcissism. So that's kind of just a little context. I mean, um, that was probably one of the first times narcissism was discussed in that way as, uh, you know, both an illness and a stage of development. And um, moving on from that though, um, in the context of art history and specifically feminist art history, um, I'm looking at narcissism 
as not maybe a problematic cultural perception that's associated with women and vanity, but um, maybe something that's not necessarily negative. So Canadian art history and historian Jane Wark notes that Freud did not see female narcissism as necessarily negative since narcissistic women acquire a certain self-contentment which compensates them for the social restrictions that are imposed upon them in their choice of a male. Um, so in, work, in Work's book, uh, Radical Gestures, Feminism, Performance Art in North America, she examines uh, the reception of 70s body art and mostly the kind that's centering on sexual difference, which was popular in that time. Um, and women artists in that period were often called narcissistic, while others might, who were male, um, escape that criticism. So a good example of that would be Vito Acconci, used his own body and his own you know, image and self in his work uh, very often and in a very narcissistic way, but he didn't quite get called a, a narcissist in uh, critics did not call him that. So, so it was kind of this challenge, I think, in the 70s where um, women were kind of uh, being, it was, a, it was a put down and it was kind of saying like, you're vain and you're not engaging with a larger discourse in your art. Um, but there's been kind of like a, a rereading of narcissism in a positive way in, in the last maybe 20 or 30 years. And so my research has kind of focused a lot on one critic, uh, her name's Amelia Jones, and she's explored narcissism's potential radicality within an art context as a departure from a traditionally patriarchal organized structure of validation. So she mainly is looking at this um, she is looking at this through the work of Hannah Wilk. Um, and Hannah Wilk was kind of met with ambivalence by critics in the 70s, um, especially by feminist critics, 70s and 80s. And that um, just mainly because she, she was, uh, I mean, kind of those same terms were used vain. She was like using her femininity as something that was um, not subverting the male gaze. So Amelia Jones is kind of arguing that um, that's not the case, though. So she's challenging those critics. And so she's asserting that the narcissism is, uh, they, it's raising the question of how those structures came to mean socially as well as culturally. Um, so looking at that argument um, and going on from there, I, I kind of just tend to disagree with her but um, mostly in in the in looking at what we consider a, like a radical self-imaging practice, um, I think that with regards to Amelia Jones and Hannah Wilk, um, sorry, I need to like <laughs> situate myself a little bit. Um, so. So the work of Hannah Wilk and other white and conventionally attractive um, cisgender heterosexual women um, should not be included in perhaps what we consider like a radical subversive feminist practice um, is what I'm arguing. And um, Jones even acquiesces to this. Uh, she says that uh, when we're looking at Laura Mulvey, who wrote um, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, um, or Bell Hooks analyses. So they kind of take a Brechtian approach, which is arguing that in order to have um, meaning, you need a sort of distance in your performance. So um, anyways, Jones kind of says that in those, looking at it through Bell Hooks or Laura Mulvey's terms, um, Wilkes' work is anti-feminist and complicit with white hegemony. So um, I'm not sure how I feel about that argument. Um, if you look at the quote up there, I think this is a pretty um, a central part of looking at the work and, and how Hannah Wilk felt about exhibiting her body, which is that um, Exhibiting oneself is difficult for other people who don't feel good about their bodies. I could have been more humble, but if I had been more humble, I wouldn't have been an artist. Um, and I think that that's kind of part of her um, argument is that she is taking pleasure in her body 
And so I kind of, I had a few slides here and they're not very well organized, but this one is her Starification series where she um, has made these kind of clay vaginal shapes that she attaches to her body um, in different poses. And then this one over here um, is a diptych. It's called I Object, Memoirs of a Sugar Giver. And she's kind of, um, she's using her body here as a way of saying like, I am the, the subject and the object in the work, and I am the one in control. And a lot of discourse around this kind of body art um, is kind of reactionary to this uh, traditional way that, you know, men, male artists, uh, have used women's bodies in their work and appropriated that without their agency. So when we look at Lucy Lippert's quote, she was a feminist critic in the 70s, um, she's talking about that same project, uh, problem with the kanji and uh, having, you know, someone who perceives a woman as beautiful questioning, you know, maybe their, their critical engagement with the work that they're making. Okay, got to skip forward here a little bit. Um, this is, I'll talk up really quickly about this image. This is Hannah Wilk in Art News, um, or actually it's her revised portrait of herself in Art News. Um, she uh, was profiled in the, in the magazine, and then she was fully clothed in that. And then in her revised portrait, she is clearly topless, but I think that the, the reason that she um, chose to take that approach was a commentary on how um, female artists' bodies were objectified in the media, and so that this was kind of the picture that was presented of her in, in the article. Um, so to provide a little bit of a contrast to this, um, looking at the work of, this is Linda, Linda Banglis in Art Forum. Um, so, let's see. So she's another female artist who had been labeled a narcissist by male critics. Um, she more, expli more explicitly used her body to prove conclusively that there are still things women may not do, according to Amelia Jones. And so here she's greased up and posing with a dildo. Um, people were really angry about this image. Critics didn't like it. Um, the art forum editors didn't like it. Uh, and it was kind of this thing that people just didn't generally saw it was really tacky, I think, and grotesque. Um, but I think that this kind of shows in, in how people have uh, read this image over time is that um, that Bangless is using her body in a way that some people may have seen as more disruptive of the male gaze. It's threatening to the male gaze because of her use of a, of a phallus. Um, so she's kind of using this image to mock like a macho artist identity complex that existed very much back in that time. Um, and so it's a little bit, when, when we're thinking about the rhetoric of the pose, which is kind of what I connect to Hannah Wilkes' work is a, is a rhetoric of posing um, this this is a more active rhetoric in, in the fact that she's kind of taking a threatening pose versus a passive pose of being maybe topless and, and um, in that other portrait. Okay, I'm going to skip forward because I'm... Um, so eroticization as a critical method is something that um, I think connects to a lot of the self-imaging practices we have going on now. So... Um, I'm going to bring up one uh, exhibition. This is also referred to in that article that I just mentioned, um, and it's called Body Anxiety. And it was, uh, it was released last year or opened last year in January, but I think it still remains relevant. Um, I mean, it's only a year old, but um, it was kind of the, the exhibition wanted to present a space for uh, female identifying artists to kind of do a lot of the same things that um, I think that some of these artists in the 70s were trying to do, which is take back agency and 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 using themselves as um, 
you know, their own, they're, they're the subject and the object, obviously, but um, also maybe through a queer lens as well in this exhibition. Um, and you can see that at bodyanxiety.com if you're interested. Um, so the, this exhibition is, is interesting because of the fact that I think that it had specific goals and aims and it's a little bit um, muddy in how maybe it achieved that. So it, it was trying to you know, address issues of representation. Who are we representing in feminist art? Who is like um, being highlighted? Um, but one of the things that the, the curator said, and her name's uh, Jennifer Chan, um, is that there might have been an inadequate presence of women of color and of queer and trans artists in body anxiety. And she wondered whether the focus on work that took pleasure in performances of femininity um, played a role in the unconscious skewing of curatorial selection toward conventionally attractive white women artists. So thinking about you know who's performing on on the internet and why and how these images circulate, I think that there has to be maybe a, a critical perspective on who gets attention for the images they take of themselves. Um, and so here's just one uh, image from that exhibition, and it's an artist named May Waver, a series called Content Aware. Um, and so. Let's see. Um, I'm not trying to say though that like this kind of art or or um, I don't know this form of feminism is maybe regressive, and I I kind of want to reiterate that because I feel weird about you know maybe being being critical of of artists who are trying to achieve things that I think are really worthwhile, but at the same time. Um, I think it's it's really valuable and necessary to per, like be critical about how they're doing it, and not to say that this is negating the work or saying it's regressive or it's anti-feminist. I, I don't believe that, but I just I want to say that um, you know it's is it subversive is the question, and what does it do um, to challenge patriarchal order? What does it do to um, kind of you know uh, upset the the hierarchies that we see in um, images of, you know, idealized bodies, and also kind of looking at how we, how people perform, coding either feminine or masculine, and what that, um, what those performances mean. So let's see, going on. I don't know. And so some might claim that true subversion of the male gaze is an impossible project. I think that's, for me, it's an open question. Um, uh, but the heteronormative kind of economies of desire that we see online and in our media and reify the concept of a beautiful woman require further dismantling. Um, so we can't exclude, um, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm going way over on this, but I'm, I just wanted to uh, say that one of the things that I think artists are, or people who are using their bodies in this way and trying to reclaim agency is that, you know, it's, it's their reclaiming of agency and the male subject is excluded in these, in these actions. Um, and I'm gonna try to wrap it up really quickly here, but just, um, I don't know if we can exclude, um, you know, the male subject from, from you know, an image in which uh, an idealized body is presented. I think that it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's working against feminism, but um, there needs to be kind of a, um, a look at what, um, yeah, like what is the consumed societal ideal? I put this tweet from Molly Soda, who's another artist, not in that exhibition, but she uses um, a lot of images of her own body. And this is just kind of her commentary on uh, what um, she perceives to be like the media using her for this body positivity thing that isn't what, apparently what she wants to be a part of. Um, so I had, I had more, but I'm way over, so I'm gonna just have to wrap it up right now. Um, anyways, thank you. Sorry, I'm gonna jump the gun here.
you mentioned Molly Soda. It feels like there's a lot of overlap already there. And I, I want to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> um, let's um, uh, so next up we have Penelope. Uh, Penelope. Penelope is a professor of cultural uh, anthropology. All, uh, sorry, uh, a professor of cultural anthropology in Greece. Uh, she writes about the cultural politics of technological mediation, uh, exploring subjects such as the media event and witnessing, uh, visuality and violence, ne networked citizen groups, uh, digital urbanism, and online affect. Uh, she recently co-authored an online open access textbook in Greek entitled uh, Digital Ethnography. Um, and uh, she is on uh, Twitter as P-E-N-E-L underscore P. Um, thanks, it's great to be here. Um, my paper is um, going to kind of put us into a different territory, but the body image is key, so maybe we'll find some parallels. Um, in the European refugee crisis, one image more than any other has galvanized Western media witnesses. The photograph of the dead body of three-year-old Kurdish Syrian Aylan Kurdi. This photograph depicts Kurdi's lifeless body, I'm okay, which washed up on the Turkish beach in September of 2015 after the flimsy boat that the family was traveling in capsized en route to Greece and ultimately the family had hoped Canada. A second photograph depicting a Turkish aid worker carrying Kurdi's corpse in a pieta pose also became iconic. The photograph of Elan's body on the Turkish beach was credited for sparking the outcry of the Western public regarding the European handling of the refugee crisis. The viral spread of the images, however, was also condemned by many as sensationalist and exploitative as trauma porn that exposed a self-indulgent orientalist voyeurism and the ethical deficit involved in regarding the pain of others, as well as the superficiality of social media oversharing. Um, as surrogate for doing something about the situation. Yet engaging the question, is it even right to share this image, I believe forecloses a discussion of what is really at stake in the public visibility of the dead body today, and specifically that of a stateless subject in inhospitable neoliberal post-colonial Europe. Debating this question as if we could or should stop this practice or repent our participation in these flows keeps us from asking important questions concerning the centrality of affect and specifically of mourning to the constitution of the contemporary public sphere in the digital age. It prevents us from really thinking about the place of the body image, by which I mean a constant move, and I'll explain this in a little bit, from mediatizing the body to materializing the image in the formation of contemporary effective networks. Sorry, this was just from a social media, so I'm a post just showing the ambivalence about um, adding the photo and deleting the photo. Um, in relation to the pseudo dilemma, I want to make two brief points. First, that it enabled the traditional press to assert its role as a guardian of propriety and voice of reason as the watchkeeper of the rational public sphere against the impulsive and emotional Twitterati. Even though the circulation of this image was also hotly debated across blogs and social media streams, discussions in the European press turned this from a question about sharing an image in a global network to one about publishing, as an editorial decision made by a few in a room in London or New York 
regarding, and this is from the, the Guardian, um, quote, potential privacy issues and the risk of repelling the reader with indecent bluntness. These few enlightened, um, it's assumed, um, should decide whether or not to publish the dead body image on the front page, as if such a thing exists anymore, or bury it, which is an indicative word, in the back pages. They have the responsibility and the right to protect us readers and irresponsible social media users, even going so far as to affix paternalistic trigger warnings and inventing um, titillating new modes of embedding. I'm not online, so I can't pull it open here. Um, in short, um, what we're seeing is an anachronistic, at least in my opinion, an opportunistic rearguard move by the previous media system. Secondly, this debate was truly academic, given that the image had already circulated widely before this was, there was a decision to publish it or re retroactively pull it. The Turkish hashtag Humanity Washed Ashore brought this phot photograph to newspaper front pages, not the other way around. Or to put it differently, and to start thinking about what all this means in relation to emerging forms of techno-sociality, Ilan's body image had already been born on the streams of social media users who mourned his unjust death. Indeed, only such deaths are mourned in this way. His body image, in other words, had already become a node of public mourning in a transnational, heterogeneous, rhizomatic network. At this point, it's important to know, oh, whoops, sorry, or to put, yes, no, yes, at this point, it's important to note how in the contemporary web context, the boundaries between getting informed about an event slip easily into testifying and mourning the losses it entails. In a single operation, witnesses testify to the suffering of the victim and to what he or she feels at its sight. The testimony can take the form of just a click to forward or reblog the image an emoticon, a few words, often not even a sentence, frequently including descriptions of the experience of witnessing. The tears shed, the shiver of shared vulnerability, the imagining of such a loss for themselves. These are not coherent statements of individuals, but effective shards that distribute subjectivity across an evolving techno-social assemblage. There is no epistemological gain, there's no knowledge of the event gained from these testimonies, and no ontological insight either. There's no insight into the experience of the victim. But rather, the sheer intensity of effective aggregation and recursive circulation. Of course, for many, the random emotionality of these unrelated mourners is exactly what offends. Since they aren't friends, or relatives, or neighbors. They aren't even from the same nation or the same religion. What right do they have to mourn? How dare they compare Ailan to their own sm spoiled child? How can they believe social media is an appropriate forum for mourning? In short, it seems that what irked in the circulation of this image was not so much the overexposure of this third world body as the banal, inauthentic, unoriginal, gratuitous, disrespectful, in short, cheap, even sacrilegious mourning of online witnesses. The debate over these images thus shifts us to the grounds of biopolitics. Which bodies have the right to be mourned in public? Who has the right to mourn them? Despite the reference here to sacred bodies in these comments here, um, it's hard to imagine outside the context of the web the apotheosis of this stateless boy who died in what has become a liminal, watery mass grave between states, between Greece and Turkey, between Europe and the East. The multitude of the internet, ignoring every protocol of nation-state symbolics and religious ritual, mourned and memorialized the non-citizen, the heterodox. They gave him shelter from catastrophe, pulling up the digital surf as a blanket. The last point uh, I want to make regarding this image has to do 
with the idea that the photograph as representation of a given event triggers responses in its viewers. This position implies that the political and aesthetic intentions of the photographer and the sensitivities of the editor preset its meaning. Yet as already suggested above, the photograph is a site of encounter between the photographed and witnesses that potentially forms an alternative civil sphere. In this case, making the non-citizen visible in the territory of the citizen, but also in the space of the image um, deteriorizing citizenship. The photographs of Ilan did not circulate as closed text with pre-known meaning and effects. They were and are constantly being remediated, augmented, transubstantiated. Other photographs have joined the stream as often happens after a death. Ilan's aunt in Canada offered up happy photographs of Ilan alive with his brother, blurring the lines between private and public mourning. These images in turn were remixed, turned into artworks, slideshows, uploaded onto YouTube, set to music, in short, memified. Each inscription underlining users' participation and creating a space of intimacy with other users. One reason this image, more than the unfortunately so many other similar ones, moved users uh, has to do, in my opinion, with the way that his body uh, seems to separate from the sand as if already a piece of clip art. The info aesthetics of digital composition is based on the modularity of the database. Derivative micro narratives are constantly formed by users, fans, here mediated witnesses from effective elements like Ilan's body image. As an icon then, the body of Ilan thus could be transported provocatively to another backdrop, to a bed, to a world map, to the floor of the uh, United Nations in provocative collages. It is also critical to note the continuum between the mediatization of materiality and the materialization of media as trace of performative acts of witnessing. The mediatization of materiality is already apparent in the first photograph of Ilan's body, which virtualizes the here and now of Ilan's death. The rematerialization of the images can be seen in its performative anchoring in a multitude of other here and nows that activate other bodies such as in graffiti in Brazil, in Frankfurt, in a sand castle in Gaza, in a protest in Morocco. Of course, in each iteration, the event grows. Its transi transitivity triggers new intensities, extending its becoming, turning the certainty of the event into a new problem about how the event relates to the present, about our connection to it and to each other. So to wrap up, um, what I've tried to show here is how the witnessing and mourning of unjust deaths is not only publicly performed in collaborative web productions, but that the effective networks that develop around these memorial nodes are productive of new kinds of publics. In the digital database era, as opposed to that of the paper analog archive, Death is not simply recorded, preserved, and verifiable. The dead become productive as the grounds for the emergence of new social networks, media forms, and effective experiences. In this morning witnessing assemblage, Ilan, Kurdish, Syrian, refugee, child, multiply excluded from political community, becomes visible, claiming retrospectively the right to protection from catastrophe. What is exposed then is less his body, as a violation of his privacy, as the very mechanisms that place his body outside the borders of protection, outside the bounds of lives that matter. With the virtual blanket uh, web mourners pulled over Ilan's body, exposed then is the vulnerability of a body that drowns because the water is safer than the land and washes up on a lonely beach. Thank you.
Thank you, Pen Penelope, for that. Uh, our next and uh, final panelist is Tim Highfield. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim is an internet researcher uh, at Queensland University of Technology. Uh, his current project is Visual Cultures of Social Media. Uh, and his research also covers politics, popular culture, uh, Eurovision, sausages, etc. Uh, all of which are featured in his first book, uh, which he has uh, with him right now, uh, uh, Social Media and Everyday Politics, uh, which is out now. So, thank you. Give it up for Tim. I'm not good with mics, so we will see how we go. Um, hi, everybody. Um, yes, I am Tim, and today I am talking about repetition, um, visual social media, visual um, media in general, um, and specifically animated GIFs. And so, as you can tell from what I just said, I use a hard G. Um, <laughs> But really, does it actually matter at all? Why do we need to have that kind of debate? Um, but I put it up there just to get it out in the open straight away. Um, so talking about loops, loops obviously take very like lots of different forms. Um, they're audio loops, audio visual loops, purely visual loops, um, of which GIFs are um, that kind. But we also have textual loops, which are um, where repetition and recursion occurs through, um, through text, automated and manual repetition, and obviously the use of original media and appropriated media, which I'm going to get into in a little bit. Um, so this loop is a hugely meta loop. It's a GIF taken of a Vine, taken of a video, taken of a flipbook, created from a GIF. So it's gone through several different um, incursions of looping to get to this point. Um, I just love that it's so meta, that I guess it hurts, I'm not sure. Um, but my, my interest in repetition is not purely because of looping as, um, as seen through GIFs. Repetition is, I, I think, a, it's a key part of online cultures, both in form and in function. So it's not just that um, content repeats, but practices around content repeat as well, and they build upon each other and they extend things further. So um, you get things like uh, the YouTube mashup of uh, the Bacon Pancake song from Adventure Time mashed up with um, the chorus of Empire State of Mind, um, which originally is about 45 seconds long. Someone else extends it to 11 minutes to take advantage of the maximum length of a video on YouTube at one point, maximum length gets extended, so someone goes and extends it to 10 hours because you can't have enough of this. Like, you, like, and the 10 hour genre of music video is, is an important genre um, within, uh, it's a subgenre on YouTube around the, like, the endless looping, or as endless as you can, um, looping of audio and visual. Um, and so repetition allows for the performance of cultural knowledge, of affect, of play and information. It's a way of displaying that you're part of like, the in crowd, that you know the, the rules and the tropes of the communities. Um, the, the way that the Michael Jackson popcorn gif is used not just as a response to things that are happening, but as a way of demonstrating that you're familiar with the culture of using that gif to respond to particular contexts and to particular situations. Um, and also, um, on, on sites and on platforms that don't necessarily allow the embedding of GIFs to do something like to just write the text popcorn.gif to stand in as the GIF itself also demonstrates this familiarity um, and kind of enforces and enhances this behavior because, again, it's repetition that like, encourages it to, to be used further. Obviously, repetition in cultural knowledge is most clearly seen in memes and mimetic practices, 
um, the repetition of templates in image macros, and this is just a like a Google image search for smalling for condescending Wonka, um, of which obviously you could just keep scrolling and there's plenty. I have no, I make no comments on the actual content because I didn't even look at it. I just wanted a screenshot. Um, so I apologize if there's anything offensive there. Um, it's just that there is so much um, using that template because it's easy for people, it's accessible. Um, the, the template repeats even if the actual wording doesn't, but it's, again, making that repetition that people can um, use and adapt for their own purposes. And as I said, like, this then allows for in-jokes and gimmicks and references and community and vernacular creativity to all prosper um, around repetition. So again, this is, um, again, a 10-hour video that then got turned even further into an 8-bit version of the 10-hour video. <laughs> Because, of course, because the internet, because this is how internet culture develops, or cultures develop, I should say. Um, also, the, the top video, the 10 hours, version 2, which then links to version 3, which is another 10 hours, which links to version 4, which is another 10 hours. It just goes on and on and on. Um, because, yes, I, I'm, I'm not actually going to try and like, explain some of these practices, because I can't. Um, but, I, like, like, I can't explain some of the things I do, but anyway. Um, and this also kind of then enhances and, and like, illustrates the development of different cultural canons or subcultural canons um, of texts that are popular and continually get referenced. And this will obviously vary depending on your community and on platform. Um, the rampant 90s nostalgia and early 2000s nostalgia currently um, inherent on BuzzFeed, for instance, um, like kind of contributes not just for, like, this is obviously from BuzzFeed contributors, both um, people using the site like, as well as BuzzFeed staff, but um, the, the reference, the, the ongoing references and collections of memes uh, and gifts from texts like Clueless, from Harry Potter, from Mean Girls, um, a lot of Disney stuff, a lot of Disney quizzes, um, and a lot of like mid 90s children's TV references, which um, obviously play into the age and generations of people who are accessing the site, but again, it enhances this idea of these are the texts that we are going to make reference to, that we are going to create meaning from, um, and that you understand so you are part of our community. Um, and so we get the way of performing culture and performing <laughs> internet culture through repetition and ritual. Oh, it didn't... Oh, there we go. Hopefully it loaded prop... Oh. As you can see, this is confused... It, 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 this is Confused Travolta, it's mashed up with Take On Me, so when, when it goes around it does actually show the actual video of him, it's amazing, I love Confused Travolta so much. Um, but again, it's like, it's again, and this is a real, I really like this meme as well as an, as an example of, it's not just creating a meme through like, taking a aspect of an image and putting it on another image, it's taking video, matching up with another video to create a GIF, like it's the the moving image meme, which I think is a really fascinating subgenre. Um, so, the GIF itself has obviously changed in appeal and aesthetic in its cultural um, kind of approval over the years. So, um, obviously, the GIF of the early web has a very different cachet, um, where you go from something like um, this, um, maybe you will load all of them, there we go, um, of the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and the under construction icons and all of the like banners and all of those things, um, I did not put the sound on, so be thankful for that. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, we have the early web gifs, and then we move into the kind of prevalence of like cat gifs, and um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I put this in for my colleague Ben Light, who this is his favourite gif of all time. So. Um, where, and obviously the internet being made of cats, like this kind of thing is prevalent even further. Um, but we also get like, things like this, like we have cinemagraphs, we have very artistic, high quality, high, like, high resolution GIFs, like taking advantage of different technological affordances and capabilities that um, are accessible but weren't necessarily applicable when you're making little um, icons of dancing hamsters. Um, and so obviously this, Busy different qualities and different aesthetics allow the GIF to play different roles um, as both communicative device, as use of everyday social media and online um, activity. Um, 
I'm not really going to talk about the GIF resurgence. Um, Jason Epping has written a great paper about it, and Shah has also done, got, got a talk about GIFs and um, various aspects of this, but I'm not going to talk about it at all. But um, obviously, different platforms, different communities around visual media online have helped to, helped to develop this, that have spread uh, different GIFs and different images of interest. Um, and the way that the, the GIFs become integrated into other contexts, so it's not just that BuzzFeed does listicles, it's that the listicle format then inspires news media to also use this format on their websites and to include GIFs into their coverage, whether it's appropriated or whether it's created from their own actual footage. Um, the integration of GIFs into everyday communication through GIF keyboards, um, so the top one on the left is RuPaul's Drag Race GIF keyboard, the one down the bottom is um, the GIF keyboard created by Riffsy. Um, again, they just integrate into, um, into um, the iPhone messaging app so that you can paste your GIFs into um, your messages to friends. Um, and the way that different platforms um, support and use GIFs. And so Twitter like, does have GIFs, but are they really GIFs because they get changed into MP4s? Um, and these also connect to other looping visual forms like Vines. Um, why this has happened? Well, it is the advantages of the GIF as file format, like the automated looping, which again, um, but as, um, as sites use different um, embedding tools and different ways of embedding, this changes where the fact that you can pause GIFs when you're seeing them on different social media platforms is different to how you would have experienced them um, like a decade ago. Um, the development of repositories and cultures around GIFs, so especially on Tumblr and through sites like Imga, where you can, where you have like these vast collections of GIFs at your fingertips to search for, to add to, um, to, to use within, you know, to use as you will, um, and the, the prevalence and the rise of the visual and the mobile as important for everyday social media activity and for engaging with, um, with friends, with topics of interest. Um, and as I said, like new ways of sharing and presenting news content. Um, the fact that as news media um, become more adept at using social media as part of their everyday coverage, they use the same tools that people are using for their everyday communication to display news. So they use Vine, they use Periscope, they use GIFs as ways of engaging with their audiences. Um, the gift, the gift then offers various things. It offers versatility, it offers um, decontextualization, and it offers intertextuality. You don't need to know the source of the text to make meaning of it or to get the meaning that people are using it for, but it helps sometimes if you do. So obviously this is taken from Dancing in the Street, the wonderfully wacky video by David Bowie and Mick Jagger. It makes no sense without the sound. It makes no sense with the sound, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> like, it's just ridiculous. Um, and so GIFs allow people to perform responses and emotions and ideas through the application of secondary texts that are in reaction to topics and events that are unrelated to the loop itself. You don't have to be referencing Zoolander to use this GIF of David Bowie. You could be, ex be expressing shock to whatever context you like. Um, there's a lot of Bowie in here. Um, I gave a talk last year at Acme about Bowie GIFs and Bowie as subject and as context but, and text women GIFs. Um, and RIP, um, obviously. Um, this is like the expression of personal creativity and fandom um, through the GIF and the advantages of the loop as kind of visual, as like socially mediated flipbook um, for expressing identity. The GIFs also allow you to tell stories and vignettes. Like there's, there's value in the humor and the particular beats of a GIF. Um, <laughs> And that's one of the advantages of the auto loop. The more it goes, the more you watch it, and it still gets funny. It's still, like, you still laugh. Like, and, effect, and obviously, this won't be the same for all GIFs, but effective ones, same with any humor. Done effectively, it will be rewarding. That's how you create meaning, that's how you create value, that's how you create people engaging with it. Um, and so, repetition can then also place emphasis on a moment, on a feeling, on a gesture, and a sensation. Um, like, there's a lot of porn GIFs on Tumblr and elsewhere, um, which partly work um, regardless of like, where they've come from and what they're actually doing there, like, but work based on the, like, they're predicated upon isolating a particular repetitive motion that loops endlessly. Um, 
And then they're used to illustrate information. This is the ABC um, in Australia. These are GIFs that um, are screenshots that are part of their everyday social media like coverage of news as a way of illustrating information, say, with using animated maps and charts and other infographics in GIF form. Um, we have perfect loops and artistic loops, which I'm not going to get into, but again, further um, ways of using the visual and the looping to be part of, like, to engage with visual media. Um, and appropriation of other visual media for new content, people mashing up other sources. This is, and again, it works differently on different communities and different contexts. This is um, a bit of soccer commentary from like 2008, um, but using, again, I don't know why I've ended up with a lot of Zealander in here. Um, <laughs> but again, it's, it's a particular canonical text. Um, and then used to underscore pathos and humor, weirdness, and commentary so it can be used for political means. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to have that one in there. Um, I also wanted to have this in there. This is not a gift, this is a vine, but this is our former Prime Minister Tony Abbott eating an onion. And it, because no one knows why, but it works, it is perfect as a vine because it is six seconds long, that's all you need to get. But this is so weird. <laughs> it's the Prime Minister, he's eating a raw onion, why? <laughs> Six seconds isolates it, puts the focus on that, and it still makes no sense. So the logics of repetition then are around the um, experience and the creation and the participation in cultural and digital literacies, um, around creativity and curation and the tension between collecting other texts and showing your knowledge of other texts and creating the stuff yourself, um, and the friction between demonstrating this knowledge and also transcending context and around new expressions and experience of temporality. So obviously the loop really messes with your idea of how long something is because it could go forever or you could stop it after two views or not at all. Um, where is this going? Um, as uh, Shah said at the start, I have a project called Visual Cultures of Social Media, which is my current research area, but I'm also interested in the experiences and practices around time online and the logics of repetition within both of these contexts. Um, and I had to finish with a gift myself. Uh, thanks to my girlfriend, Kate, for this. Um, this is from the Association of Internet Researchers Conference last year, doing um, SingStar Common People. So thank you very much. These are my details. Thank you. Now I can't get this to do things. There we go. everyone for um, your presentations it's been there's I feel like there's a lot of uh, resonant themes going on um, in all in a lot of the work um, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, solidarity I wanted to ask you all about solidarity a little bit uh, it seems like uh, you know I, I I look a lot at like you know the visual culture of solidarity and repetition and things like that but then it also feels like, uh, Penelope, in your presentation, there's a lot of issues around solidarity through uh, repetition or remixing as well. Um, so I wanted to just ask you all, like, how, do, how does solidarity in the public feel like on these platforms that are not, um, not their own? They're on YouTube, they're on Twitter, they're on Tumblr, that sort of thing. I don't know if anyone wants to take a first step. How does solidarity feel? Is that the question? Yeah, what... Um, what does it look like? What I'm curious about is um, what you think about solidarity on, uh, on platforms. Uh, solidarity in public, okay. which is a different... It feels like a different thing than right. solidarity in private. 
I guess uh, for me, the the idea of solidarity entered into my uh, work at all because, like, Naomi Wolf brings it up in that book, in The Beauty Myth, and she says, well, print media could be a place where we could raise consciousness as, um, as it is a place where we know sort of women are paying attention, and I guess the internet is that uh, for women and non-women and whatever. Um, but she, she dismisses it, ultimately, print media, as a place where solidarity can be cultivated because it's controlled by advertising interests. Um, and so in looking uh, to sort of a rearrangement of this media paradigm that Naomi Wolf is critiquing, um, I see the review video and they're rampant as, as a practice of solidarity because it's about you know, not wasting your money, not wasting your time on a product that doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And uh, sort of the media that you can access about products usually being controlled by either the companies that produce the products or um, sort of beauty editorial staffs who are not to be trusted again because of their association with advertisers. Um, so f for me, solidarity in public uh, is, I guess, about sharing information. Um, and it's also not necessarily like a be-all liberatory, mm. like, gesture. It's, you know, there's there are always limits to, I guess, what solidarity can be done in public, um, or at least in the the instances that I'm looking at. Um, I don't know. Is that sufficient? Yeah. I guess I would say two things. There's definitely, um, and maybe this is, there's an overlap, um, with the idea of the, the personal photograph as a site of identification. That's easy identification. Um, but I also would agree that it's, the solidarity is kind of a heavy word with ideological weight because I think a lot of these actions, it's not so much, you know, a conscient, conscious choice that I'm doing, you know, a click. It's things that are much more, you know, this, I'm interested in this idea of sort of more distributed um, subjectivity and rather than sort of an individual saying, okay, now I saw this photograph and now I'm going to go and fly to Greece and become a, a volunteer, even though people did do that. So there's a lot, basically there were a lot of other flows of material goods after this. I mean, there's a whole other discussion of, you know, did this do anything? Did this change anything? And in Greece, in fact, they're <laughs> very negative about, did it do anything? But I think it's based on a sort of old, another idea of politics. Like, that this isn't so clearly political. So people's, you know, along with all these cliques, there's also a lot of uh, money flowing, goods flowing, people moving, but maybe not as solidarity so consciously. I think there's also like um, there's kind of a, a push suddenly on popular social media towards a kind of almost an automated solidarity. Um, this is only visually. So after the Paris attacks last year, um, with Facebook enabling like the temporary profile um, overlay of the of the tricolor, um, and in the way that particular hashtags, um, like, and I've written a little bit about that. Like um, after the Charlie Hebdo attack. Um, at the start of last year, like, Je suis Charlie, then not just, and the contestation of that, obviously, but also the way that the Je suis template um, becomes its own kind of, diff like, it becomes al almost automated, like, in response to Paris attacks, the Brussels attacks, um, Beirut, um, Lahore, um, like, the, like, and same with the visual in, in that kind of thing, like, where there's the visual statement like with these hashtags, with the, like with particular imagery in response to this, um, and like and some of that will come through through gifts, but it's also through other visual media as well. And there's, I, like whether that's, it's not the same kind of solidarity as say with um, solidarity between protest movements, um, where like it's dem like where demonstrations of solidarity are like standing, like between different occupy groups like standing together even at a distance this is more of a kind of I'm not denigrating it just it's perhaps a more kind of mundane fleeting form of solidarity than um, might be seen in like other practices that's a really interesting point it reminded me of kind of the I mean that je suis like Facebook prof profile thing, um, how solidarity can kind of be exclusionary in some ways, and 
like that for instance was a time when you know a lot of people I think were wondering why is this like the image that we're presented with or the the time when we're asked to be in solidarity when there's all these uh, you know there's many other terrible things happening in the world that we could be banding together to you know provide support for and then it's so yeah so it's kind of like why Facebook is pushing this solidarity, but is this the solidarity that I'm going to engage in? And, and if so, why? Just one thing. On the humanity washed ashore hashtag, you'll see the Je suis part that's joined together. Yep. So I think, and that also has been really indicative of how the, <laughs> the refugee issue has been handled after that. It turned towards more Islamophobia, whatever, yep. after that. So it's not by chance. How does that, um, that's, I, I think it's interesting what you brought up I mean, in your presentation and just now around uh, Naomi Wolf's critique of uh, print media. Mm -hmm. um, do you, in terms of, you know, being too much about advertising or that kind of thing, does that then still stand in these online platforms? Uh, like we're talking about Facebook uh, providing filters, uh, we're talking about uh, the money uh, passing back and forth. How, how does that, uh, how does that play into these sorts of issues? Um, I think, if anything, sort of compared to print media, it might be almost more difficult to understand where uh, advertisers' inf interests like lie when we're using these um, online platforms. Uh, for example, like Facebook's interests um, in, I don't know, promoting solidarity with Paris or something like this. Uh, there, I think there's a tendency when we talk about the internet versus older forms of media to say that uh, it's completely different and it's revolutionary and it's this and it's that. Um, and I don't, you know, it's like the YouTubers that I talk about are also enacting sort of a form of advertising in, in doing these reviews so that these kind of, these interests are, are conflicting within their performances and that was something that was that was really interesting to me and sort of what drew me to the review videos. Um, but, I mean, I, I think that uh, whatever, private interests are still certainly driving these platforms in the way that they're developed and they're also uh, influencing who gets famous and for what reason. Um, and they, you know, we need to, to keep a critical eye on those as well. But at the same time, I think you know, it is a, it's just a different model. It's not necessarily that, like, um, you know, y YouTube reviews of products are going to escape adver advertising interests. It's far from it. You can monetize your channel really easily. That's kind of what's appealing to YouTube, to YouTubers, and um, sort of about YouTube as a platform is that it's very monetizable and it's, uh, you know, certain, like, features are unlocked to you as you gain followers and things, um, or viewers, subscribers. Uh, so... I think that the, the media landscape is just getting more complicated than sort of the one that, that Wolf is critiquing. Um, yeah. Um, I think uh, we're running a little over time, so do we have, uh, I would love to get a couple questions from the audience. Yeah. You can shout them out, we'll pick them up on the mic. Yeah. Um, okay, I was just wondering about, um, Tim, like, the idea of these repetitive things as sort of ephemera, you are, where you're taking something that can be really small and sort of blowing it up into, say, like, a ten-hour-long thing. And so I think Victor Bergen sort of wrote about this idea of, like, image scraps and how you can have, like, say, the Jaws theme tune, you know, you just make that noise and everyone knows you need the Jaws film, but also it's a reference in the same way that you can use GIFs, like, um, you can make the Jaws noise about like the date you had last night and everyone will be like, oh, I get you. Um, so what do you think, is it sort of um, that these repeated images or sounds are like canonizing something and making it into something more iconic or is it just it more about splitting things up into little things? Like, like you were saying about the sort of friction between um, identifying with something and showing you've got, got the reference and taking it out of context. I think it's both, um, really. Like, I think that there's, like I had on my scrolled notes that I didn't, didn't refer to at all, like I had the GIF as visual shorthand where like you can use the image in the same way that people use like, um, 
like use other visual media like emoji, like where you can use a particular thing and it will mean something regard like especially to a to a particular group of people like you have the the cultural knowledge that this is you know the meaning that that, that is being um, like intended through that um, as certainly the the iconization um, is important there that like there are some there are some gifts that have like lasted for a very long time that like take on their own kind of meanings of their own um, appropriations because they have been part of the landscape for so long. Um, same with any other media. And certainly it's not just through gifts, it's through like other forms of popular culture that contributes to whether something becomes iconic or not. If it keeps getting referenced by other people and in other texts, then that awareness will develop without people having to really know what the original was. Um, like, um, but like, there's there's also like a cottage industry and a, like um, importance placed like for, for different people on like cutting things up into very small things to make to use their own particular texts that perhaps four people will see, but they they want to make that moment and to use that in their own content. So, I think. Like I, I generalized a lot in this talk because there are obviously a lot of genres of gifts and a lot of different practices and communities that use them. Um, and I'm certainly not intending to be exhaustive with this, but I think like both of the things that you've mentioned are at play here. Um, I think like the, there's a, like some important points around ephemera versus like kind of permanent but looping and stretching into infinity that I can draw upon in future revisions of this. Yeah, thank you everyone.